All right. <coughs> well, hello, everyone. This is 13 ways of looking at a turtle. Um, my name is Scott Volushin. I have a website, fsharpforfunandprofit.com, and the slides and the video for this talk will go on the turtle subdirectory at some point. <coughs> um, I'm going to be using F Sharp for all the code examples, um, but this is really a, a talk about concepts. So um, most of this stuff will work in other programming languages, especially functional programming languages, Haskell and Scala and so on. All right. <coughs> so most talks are, are you know, on a particular topic, and I thought, why not take one problem domain and show you lots of different ways of solving the same problem um, with different techniques. Um, so it's like a sort of taster menu. <coughs> so I'm going to be talking about a lot of um, functional, mostly functional programming techniques, partial application, functional error handling, state monad, actor model, event sourcing, dependency injection, um, and so on and so on, interpreter capabilities. <coughs> um, 13 different ways in all. And um, this is a little bit scary because that gives me about four minutes per topic. So this is how I feel. Ah. Um, I've done a similar talk. If you actually find this talk interesting, believe it or not, I have another talk on functional design patterns. Same kind of thing. Lots and lots of stuff very, very quickly. Right. I got, I've already used up a minute and a half. <coughs> Time to get cracking. All right. So turtle graphics, you should be familiar with this. If you're not, the concept is you have a turtle. It's pointing in a, a particular direction. It moves around. And as it moves around, it draws lines. That's basically it. So the turtle API that I'm going to work with basically has four functions or four you know, operations. Move a certain distance in a straight line. Turn some sort of angle, left or right. Uh, put the pen up, put the pen down. If the pen is down, then it's going to draw. And if the pen is up, it won't draw. And that's basically it. So <clears throat> how can we have 13 different Im implementations of this particular API? Let's see. Let's start with the object oriented turtle. And I have a little bell here to remind me to keep going fast. <coughs> All right, object oriented turtle. Um, in an object oriented turtle, the data and the behavior are combined into one uh, object, of course. Uh, OO turtle is a tootle, if you didn't know what that is. <coughs> so, um, an OO turtle, you have a turtle class and you have a client that calls it. Now, the turtle needs to keep track of where it is on this canvas. It needs to know its position. It needs to know which uh, angle it's pointing. It needs to know whether the pen is up or down. So there's some turtle state associated with this turtle. And in the OO model, the turtle state is inside the turtle, and it's mutable. You, can't, you don't have access to it from, as, a, as a client. So I call the turtle, and it updates its state. I call the turtle again, it updates its state. <coughs> so let's look at the code. Here is a beginning of a turtle class in F-sharp. And here's the three different things we need to keep track of, the position, the angle, and the state. A couple of things to point out. First of all, there's a mutable keyword. So in F-sharp, um, things are immutable by default. So if you want them to be mutable, you have to use the mutable keyword. Um, secondly, I'm using this degrees annotation. And that's part of the F-sharp units of measure. And what you can do is you can take a number and annotate it with some sort of uh, measurement, like in this case degrees. And why did I do that? So I didn't get them mixed up with radians. So you know you want to separate you know kilometers from inches or milliseconds from seconds. Uh, units of measure are a great way of doing that. Um, in this case, not only does it stop me accidentally passing in radians, but it's the documentation. So it says you know it's obviously that I'm passing in degrees and not radians. <coughs> All right, the move method. So to move, I have a particular distance I want to move. I'm going to log it. I'm going to start with the start position. I'm going to calculate the new position, this distance at this angle, starting from here. That gives me an end position. Uh, if the pen state is down, I'm going to draw from the start position to the end position. And then I'm going to update the state. Um, this backwards pointing arrow is the assignment operator in F-sharp, different from equality, because you only, you only need it when you have mutable data. So that's, the, that's the move method. Uh, the turn method is very similar. I want to turn a particular angle, so I'm going to log it. I'm going to calculate a new angle using some sort of formula. And then I'm going to update the state <coughs> with the new angle. Um, the pen up thing is very similar. Log it, update the state. Log it, update the state. So that's our four methods implemented in an OO style. So from the caller's point of view, this is really obvious. 
You basically create a turtle, you ask it to move a distance, you ask it to turn, you ask it to move a distance, you ask it to turn, and so on and so forth. And in this case, you end up where you started with, so you've drawn a triangle. So let's actually look at some code. <coughs> so this is the F-sharp interactive. So I'm going to create a canvas for the turtle. I'm going to go, here's the turtle. Move a certain distance. Turn, move, move again, turn, move, move again. And you can see not only is it drawing on the canvas, but I'm also outputting the log down here at the bottom. So that's just to prove that it's a real code. It's not just a fake uh, presentation here. <coughs> All right, so advantages and disadvantage of OO. Well, the advantage, really big advantage is it's really familiar to most people. Um, that's probably the main advantage. There's quite a lot of disadvantages. To me, the biggest disadvantage is that it's stateful. It's a black box. It's like I call this thing, but I don't get any response. It, it does some stuff, but I don't really know what it's doing because I can't see inside it. Um, it's hard to test because I have to, you know, I can't really just like put it in a position. I have to like move it to this thing. Setting up tests is hard. You can't really compose them. If I want to have a two turtle thing, I have to create a whole new class which holds two turtles and, you know, proxy the methods down and so on. And so far, in this one, we've got some hard-coded dependencies. We're hard-coding the logging technique, and we're hard-coding the canvas. Now, we can get rid of that using dependency injection, and I'll talk about that later on. <coughs> OK. Number two, abstract data turtle. So this technique goes all the way back to the 70s. This is pre-OO. And in this technique, the data is separate from the behavior. So we have a data structure. Again, it's, all the stuff is mutable. But the difference is it's a private data structure. The only person who, or the only thing that can change this data is the turtle functions. So as a, it's an opaque, from, from a caller's point of view, it's an opaque data structure. And again, I have this behavior. <coughs> I have, uh, these are now static methods or functions in a module. Each function now needs the state to be passed in because it's static. So it's explicit state management. And again, to use it, I create a turtle. And I do the same thing as before, except each time now I have to pass the turtle in by hand. But it's the same, same idea. OK. So what are the pros and cons of this technique, which is older than OO? Well, the advantage is it's really simple to implement. And one of the advantages actually now is that you can't do inheritance. So you can't actually use object-oriented techniques. So if you think that inheritance is sort of an anti-pattern now, and that composition is better than inheritance, this technique forces you to use composition. So that might be what you want. Disadvantages, the same as in OO. It's stateful. It's a black box. It's hard to set up. It's hard to test. Right, next, functional turtle. So in a functional turtle, the state is immutable. Other than that, it's very similar to the abstract data turtle. Um, because the state is immutable, the client or the caller has to create the state, pass it into a function, and get a new state back, and then get that state, pass it into a function, and get the new state back. So the client is now very much involved in managing the state, which it wasn't with the OO methods. <coughs> um, the design is very similar. We now have an immutable turtle state. We don't have to have the mutable keyword anymore. And because uh, it's immutable, we can make it public. It's not a problem if someone accesses these properties because they can't mess with them. They can't change them. Um, the same thing, we have these four functions now. We pass the state into each function. But in addition, we return the state. So that's the big difference between this one and the one where the state is mutable. So it's very much is even more explicit now. So to use this code, we basically start with initial state. We'll call it S0. Um, we pass that in, and that gives us state one. <coughs> Sorry. Um, state one, we pass in, and that gives us state two. We pass in state two, and that gives us state three, and so on and so forth. So it's all very explicit. It's all very nice, but it's kind of ugly, you know, kind of annoying to pass the state around like this. Is there a way we can make this nicer looking? And the answer is yes. 
And that relies on the fact that every, in, in a functional world, every turtle, every function has um, one input and one output. So if we have two functions and we want to chain them together, we can take the output of one function and feed it as the input to the next function. And that is how composition works. And in F sharp, we typically use the piping concept, which is F sharp's version of this. Um, and this is very similar to Unix pipes. You take the output of a command and you feed it as the input of the next command. <coughs> so with pipes, um, the code would look like this. Start with initial state. We pipe it into the move function. We take the output of the move function. We pipe it into the turn function. We take the output of the turn function. We pipe it into the move function. We take the output of that, and so on and so forth. So this vertical bar with angle bracket, that is F sharp's pipe operator. It's not a vertical bar because the vertical bar is reserved for something else. Right. So what's the pros and cons? Well, because everything's immutable, it's a lot easier to reason about. I know, I know exactly what's going in and what's coming out. There's no black box. Um, I mean, obviously, it's doing stuff, but I can see what it's doing because I get the state coming out the other end. So it's really easy to test this way. I can just, if I wanted to start in a particular corner, I just set the initial state to be in that corner. And as we've seen, the functions are composable. It's really easy to glue them together because they have no global state. The downside is that the client has to keep track of the state. And again, we have these hard-coded dependencies. And in a bit, I'll talk about how you can do sort of the functional equivalent of dependency injection. <coughs> Next, the state's monad. <coughs> so um, what happens if the state, if the, if the thing is a bit more complicated? So let's say we have our turtle, and it hits the wall, and it can't go any further. Now, we want to return something to the caller that says something went wrong. So one way we can do this is just return the actual distance moved as opposed to what you requested. You wanted to move 10 units, and you actually only moved 5 units. So we now need to return, for example, a pair with the new state and, as part of the pair, the actual distance moved. So here's the usage example. We start with initial state. We pass that into the move. And we get a pair back, the actual distance and, the and state 1. If the actual distance is less than what we wanted, then it failed, and we're going to turn the turtle, and so on. And if the actual distance was correct, then the first move succeeded. And we try again, and we get another actual distance. And this is really ugly, right? I mean, it's all very explicit. It's all very you know, clear what's going on. But passing the state around is, is horrible. And um, unfortunately, we can't do the piping technique because the output is now this pair. It's not the individual state that we can just pass into the next function. So how can we keep track of the state when we have a situation like this? So we've got, what we're going to do is we're going to take the turtle function and go through a series of transformations and turn it into something which is more tractable, something which is more composable. So the turtle function that we have right now has two inputs and two outputs. The, one of the inputs is the turtle state, and the other input is the runtime input, the, the distance to move or the angle to turn or whatever it is. Uh, the two outputs, one of the outputs is the, the new turtle state, and the other output is the output of the function, the actual distance moved or the actual distance turned or whatever it is. So how can we turn this into something we can work with? Well, the first thing is we can turn it into a two-step function. Uh, uh, the input returns another function. So rather than having a two-parameter function, we have a one-parameter function that returns another one-parameter function. And that's called currying, and that's a fundamental part of functional programming. In F sharp, you get that for free. So in fact, the function is automatically like this. And if we have this curried um, model, we can actually think of the turtle function as returning a new function. So I pass in the distance I want to move, and I don't just get a new state, I get a new function. And so we're going to take this function here, right? Returning another function is standard practice, but it's kind of ugly. We're going to take this function, we're going to put a wrapper around it, and we're going to call it state, all right? So the state is really just a wrapper around a function. <coughs> but what we've done now is we have a function with one input and one output. And now we can chain these together. We can't chain them together directly. We can chain them together using a special technique, which I'm not going to go into. Um, if you want to know more about it, I have a talk called the Monadster talk, which is all about the state monad. 
But uh, assuming that we can compose these functions together, what we can do is we can create a special thing called a state expression, a state computation expression. That's this little state thing in, in red there. And it's kind of like a special block, a special code block. Inside the code block, the state has been managed behind the scenes. So when I write this code here, you know, move and then turn, move again, um, all that code, the state has actually been threaded through that code without me having to do anything. So this code looks much nicer. It looks like the original code we had. It looks like imperative code. But it's not. It's actually stateless, immutable code that we had originally, made nice looking by this state expression. <clears throat> and we'll see a lot of this in the next couple of slides as well. So um, the state being threaded through the scenes is, is a really nice feature. Now this is um, a very common technique, and most functional programming languages have equivalent of this. So Haskell has do notation. Uh, Scala has four comprehensions. They're all related to monads. Um, the F-sharp computation expressions are kind of related to monads. Um, advantages. So it looks like imperative code. It looks like as, as if the state is actually changing, but it isn't. It's just immutable behind the scenes. But the nice thing is, even though it's got this complicated stuff, the functions are still composable. We can still glue functions together. Downside, much harder to implement, kind of, and it's, it's tricky to use in practice. Next, all right, <clears throat> error handling. So let's say we want to handle errors in a different way. Let's say when we hit the edge of the wall, rather than returning the actual distance, we're going to say, sorry, you made a mistake. That was a, a, a failure. So how can we handle that in a functional way? What we want to do is have the function return two different possibilities. Uh, either it succeeded or it failed. So if it succeeded, I get a new turtle state back. Uh, and if it failed, I'm going to return an error message saying, you know, you went out of bounds or something. So how can we model a, a function that returns two choices? No, it's not the two values, you know, together. It's like one or the other one. So in F sharp, you would model this using a choice type like this. And a choice type is kind of like inheritance, a little like a subclassing. You basically have two possibilities, and they're mutually exclusive. It's either a success or it's a failure. If it's a success, there's some information associated with that. If it's a failure, there's some information associated with that too. Uh, and this, I call these choice types. Uh, technical word is sum types. In F sharp, they're called discriminated unions. They're all pretty much the same thing. Really, really nice feature. Unfortunately, most object-oriented languages do not have anything like this. Very, very powerful. So let's look at how we would implement the move function using this result. So we want to move a certain distance. So we, we calculate the new position, we draw the line. Let's do the error handling. If the actual distance moved is not what we wanted, then we're going to return a failure. Um, if it was what we wanted, we're going to say it's successful, and we're going to return the new state, the state with the updated position. So again, there's two possible choices for the output. Now, because there's two possible choices, when I actually call this code, I have to test and see which one it is. So let's look at how that works. So there's my initial turtle state. I'm going to move, and I'm going to get one of these results. So I have to test, is it a success or a failure? And I do that with pattern matching. So if it's successful, that's great. I'm going to try and move again. I get another result. I'm going to see, was the second result success or failure? If it's successful, I'm done. If it was a failure, I print an error message. And then I also need to handle the case where the first one was a failure. So again, this is all very nice and explicit, but it's, again, it's kind of ugly to keep track of all these, you know, to be testing these special cases all the time. Can we make it simpler? Yes. So let's avoid some yuckiness and create a new kind of expression. This is a result computation expression. And again, it's a special kind of block which handles all the failure cases. So if there's a success, it keeps going. So like this, if the move was successful, it will do this next step. And if that was successful, it will do the next step. And if that was successful, it will do the next step. If there's any failures along this line, it will basically go to the bottom. It will kind of bypass all this code and go directly to the you know, bottom of the code. So very similar to how we do the state, the same kind of thing. All right, there's the result expression. 
So again, we've turned something kind of nasty looking into something which is manageable. Now in this code, we still have this uh, state hang. We keep passing the state to every single function. What we can do is we combine. We can take the state one um, and the result one and combine them into a combined expression. So we're going to create a result state expression, both of them. And now when we do this, we've got rid of the state as well. There's no state in any of this code. So this code looks really imperative. It looks like, just like the object-oriented code, really. It's like move here, move here, turn here, move here. Um, but unlike the object-oriented object code, there's error handling built in, and there's state management built in. So there you go. That's quite nice. So we've got this. Uh, these these uh, com computation expressions in F-sharp are a very nice way of hiding all this nastiness. So what have we got here? We've got explicit errors. We're not throwing exceptions. We don't have to look in the documentation to see if it's going to be a failure or not. For example, the pen up and the pen down might not return a failure. But the move function, we can tell it returns a failure because it's going to return this t t type, which is either success or failure. But when we write the code, it looks like the happy path code. It doesn't look like we've got all this nasty error handling. There's nothing about handling exceptions or try catch or anything. It's all, ha it's all handled for me. Downside, again, harder to implement and harder to use. Uh, I might have a whole talk on this topic too, which is the railway-oriented programming talk, which you might have heard of. All right. Next, async turtle. Um, this is like five and a half. This is sort of a bonus thing. So it's actually 13 and a half ways of looking at a turtle. Um, what happens if the turtle is actually a real robot turtle and you actually are sending you know, remote signals to it to get something to happen. So the turtle call is going to be async then, right? You're going to have to send a thing and wait for a response. So how would we handle that? Well, very similar. We have an async move. Now with an async, you basically do something and then you have to have a callback. So like when it finishes doing what it's, it's going to call you back. So it's going to call you back with the new state. All right? And when it's called me back, I'm going to make another move. And then when it's finished doing that, it's going to call me back with a new state. And I'll make another move, and when it's done, it'll call me back with a new state. So this is a very common pattern when you have async code, when you have a lot of callbacks. You get this thing called the pyramid of doom, because it ends up going further and further out. <coughs> How can we make this easier? Um, we've got all these nasty callbacks. We really don't want to see these in our, in our code. If we can help it, is there a way of getting rid of them? So this is a trippity, triple yuckety yuck callback stuff, very nasty. Um, yes, async expression. Again, we have another computation expression. And what this one does is it hides the callbacks behind the scenes. So when I write the code, I say move async. Um, but I don't have to worry. There's no callback. Basically, the callback happens automatically. And then I move async again, and I move async again. And the ace, again, it looks like um, normal code. But the async callback is handled behind the scenes. So um, there's a pattern here. We've got the state thing. We've got the result thing. We've got the async thing. They're all the same kind of pattern. And that pattern is the famous M word, right, monads. So monads is the commonality between these patterns. So let's review what we've done so far. Um, we're using composition a lot. We're chaining functions together. We haven't created any new objects every time we wanted to do something. Um, we've got explicit state management. We've got no mutation. We've got explicit errors. We're not throwing any exceptions. Um, all this explicitness is great. It makes it really easy to test. It makes it easy to reason about. The downside is it looks really ugly. But we have techniques to make that easier to work with. We can hide the state and the errors and the callbacks behind the scenes using monadic composition, uh, these computation expressions. All right, next. OK, batch processing. <coughs> now. In all the examples so far, the caller has been managing the state. And it's painful, basically. Uh, even, even with all these computation expressions, it's still painful to manage state. How can we have it so that the caller avoids managing state altogether? Well, the first technique we'll look at is just a batch processing. What we're going to do is create a bunch of commands and send it to a batch processor. <coughs> so from the client's point of view, I create a command, and I create a whole bunch of list of commands. And I send it to the batch runner. 
and the batch runner is going to loop over all the commands and run them in turn, each one in turn, actually calling the turtle functions. And as part of its loop, it's going to be keeping track of the state. So the client no longer has to keep track of the state. This batch processor is going to keep track of the state. So that's nice. From the client's point of view, it's much nicer. But the, we have a problem, which is <coughs> these commands are data. And our API is not data, it's functions. So how can we turn our API, which are these four functions, how can we turn this into uh, a data structure that we can send down the wire to the batch process? Well, it's quite simple. We use another choice type. And basically, for each function in the API, we create a choice. So there's a function called move, which has a, a distance parameter. We're going to create a, a, a choice case, which has a distance thing associated with it. Uh, the turn is going to have an angle associated with it. The pen up doesn't have any data associated with it. The pen down doesn't have any data associated with it. So um, we now have a turtle command which mirrors the, uh, the turtle API, except it's pure data. This can be serialized and put on the wire. So choice type to the, to, for the win again. So here's the client code again. Here's my list of commands. Right. Now, these look like function calls, but it's actually data. When I say move 100, I'm actually creating a data structure. And when I say turn 120, I'm creating a data structure. So this is actually a list of data records. Right. I take this list, and I send it to the batch processor, and it runs them all at once. So from the client's point of view, that's very nice. <coughs> no state anywhere. But it's, this, this thing about being data is really important. We'll come back to it later. Now, on the batch runner side, it's going to have to execute this data structure. And how is it going to do that? Well, very straightforward. For each case, it's going to execute a particular turtle function. So for the move case, it's going to move the turtle. For the angle to turn case, it's going to turn the turtle, and, and so on and so forth. And notice that in the inside, it, it's got this state. It's keeping track of the state. All right? The state is passed in at the beginning, and it comes out the other end. So the, the overall implementation for the run is going to say, OK, start with the initial state. Uh, for each command in the list of commands, you're going to loop through them. And you're going to execute the command for each one. It's going to create a new state. And then after you've looped through all the commands, you're going to have the final state. And that is what you return back to the caller. Now, this is basically a for loop. We've all written these. But in uh, F sharp, you wouldn't actually bother to write this, because actually this is built-in function called fold. Um, all functional languages will have this as part of their library. In C sharp, it's uh, the link function uh, link.aggregate. Very useful. I basically would not write your own, don't write your own iterations. Learn to use the collection functions which are already built into the library. So this is list fold. We'll be seeing fold again shortly. All right, so what's the advantages and disadvantages of the batch processing? Well, first of all, it's completely decoupled. Because I'm sending data, I have absolutely no idea what the implementation is. That's really nice. That's really decoupled. <coughs> it's a lot easier than working with monads. The state is much, much easier. Um, the downside is batch-oriented. Right? I, I have to do all the commands at once. And the other disadvantage is there's no control flow. Like If the first command fails, I, don't, I can't choose and say, well, if it fails, I want to do this. And if it doesn't fail, I want to do this. It's like, here's a bunch of commands. It's fire and forget. And then I just have to take it all or nothing. So that's the downside. But if you can get away with it, that's really nice. All right, next, actor model. <coughs> so the actor model is quite similar to the batch model, except it's sort of like a real-time version of the batch model. So in the actor model, I have a command, exactly the same kind of command I used before. But this time, I'm going to put it on a queue. Uh, the actor is basically a little message loop that reads things off the queue processes the command, uh, and then goes back and goes around the loop again. So again, all the state is kept track of in the actor. The client doesn't have to keep track of the state. The turtle doesn't keep track of the state. The state is sort of in, in between the two. So let's look at the code. So all actors have a loop. Uh, the loop takes the, the initial turtle state that comes in. We also then read a command from the message queue. Um, we create a new state. How do we create the new state? By testing the command. If it's a move, we move the turtle, and so on. 
We, we run the command the same way we did, exactly the same way we did before. We get a new state, and then the difference is we now take that new state and we feed it back into the top. We take the new state and we loop again. It's a recursive loop. And then that loop will then block waiting for another command on the message queue. So the actor model and the um, batch model are, you can share a lot of code between the two models. All right, so very similar, but except you have now this recursive loop which blocks each time through the loop. So again, from the caller's point of view, it's really easy to use. I create a turtle, uh, and I post a message now, because it's, a, it's a, a queue. I post the move message, I post a turn message, I post a move message. But unlike the batch model, every time I post a message, the turtle responds pretty much straight away. Right? So it's not exactly real time, but it's, you know, it's responsive to what I do. I don't have to wait until I've finished all the commands. <coughs> all right. So pros and cons of the actor model. Again, very decoupled. I have no idea what the implementation is. I'm just sending it data. Again, simpler than working with a state monad. Downside, kind of lots of boilerplate associated with actors. Not quite as easy to understand. But I think you know, if you're managing state, this is one of my favorite ways of managing state if I have a mutable state like this. Next, event sourcing. Right. So event sourcing, the diagrams are going to get more and more complicated as we go on. So we started with, with getting past the simple ones and getting more complicated. <clears throat> and the event sourcing issue really is how do we persist the state um, between runs? So the actor model, if, if, the, if your program crashes, you've just lost everything. So we want to persist the state so that if the actor crashes, we can, load, we can start off where we, we you know, pick up where we left off. Or if we want to start up in another server, a server goes down, we want to run another server, we can scale out whatever. It's nice to persist it. So we could just store it straight in a database. But um, one of the things about functional programming is that you might want to have an immutable database, a database that you can't just update, you can only append to. So if you want to append to something, you just uh, it's a different design altogether. <coughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to append to the database, to the event store, an event. And an event is basically the diff between before the command and after the command. So like what changed as a result of running this command? So we get a command in from the command handler, and we're gonna, we have this event store which has a list of the previous events. We're going to read the previous events into memory. We're going to recreate the state by, by applying all these events. And now we have the state that it was before the command. We then execute the command, and that actually talks to the turtle and does all the work. And then the, when the command is finished, the output of the command is a bunch of new events. And these new events get put back into the event store. And so the new events represent what changed between before the command and after the command. Because again, when we get the next command, we're going to take these new events and read them up as part of the event history to recreate the state. <coughs> so that's basically how event sourcing works. Um, so one of the things is, what is the difference between a command and an event <coughs> in event sourcing? Um, seems to be a tricky question sometimes, but let's actually have a look. So here's our, our, our turtle command. We've got our four different choices here. Um, the command is what you want to have happen. It might not actually happen. I say I want to move here, and I want to move this distance, but if I hit the wall, it might not work. I might not have actually moved anything, I, or I, you know, I might have only moved half as, half as much. So just because you want it to happen doesn't mean it actually happened. Now, an event is what actually happened. So when I uh, have an event, everything's going to be in the past tense. I actually moved this distance. And I actually turned this angle. And I actually moved the pen up and down. And you can see that the, um, the event is not quite the same as the command. I, it doesn't have to be one-to-one -one correspondence. And you can store some extra data here. So you know, in the command, I wanted to move a certain distance. But in the moved event, I can keep track of what the start position and the end position was as well, because that's kind of helpful. Or I can keep track of not only what the angle I wanted to turn, but what the actual final angle was. So this is what actually happened, and it's always past tense. And again, if we compare it with the command, we can see it's subtly different. So it's the events that we store in the event store in the database. It's not the commands. That's why it's called event sourcing. 
So, there's two uh, important parts of the event sourcing. Well, we've seen how to actually apply a, a command, but let's talk about how do we apply an event. We have a historical event, we have a particular state, and we want to, you know, the, the, like I say, the event is sort of the diff between the previous state and the new state. So, if it's a moved event, um, we say, well, the state was over here, and now the new state is over here. Uh, if it was a turned event, we can say, well, the original, you know, the state is now at this new final angle. And that's one of the reasons we can store this extra data in the state, because it makes some of this um, handling much easier. Notice that we are not calling the turtle. Okay, this is purely an in-memory state-changing <coughs> operation. We are not call there's no I.O., it's all pure. Okay? <coughs> so this is uh, one of the key uh, functions that you need to implement with an event sourcing model. All right, no side effects, very important. Nothing happens. We're just looping through the things and modifying the state to get back to what it was before the command happened. And then to actually handle the command then, very simple, we load all the events from the event store. That gives us our event history. We recreate the state before the command by looping through all the events and applying that uh, uh, apply event thing. So that's again we're using the list fold to do that, which is basically the for loop. And then now we have the state that it was just before the command, which would have been the same as if it had been using the actor model or something. We have the state in memory. We apply the command. We execute the command. Um, that changes the state, and it creates some new events. And then these new events are then written back into the event store. So again, very critical that the, when you're rebuilding the state, there's no side effects. When you're executing the command, that's where the side effects happen. That's where you actually move, move the turtle. All right, pros and cons of event sourcing. Again, very decoupled from the implementation, stateless. Um, what's nice is it supports the replay of events. If the business logic changes, you have the history of everything that happened. You have an audit trail for free. Many nice features about event sourcing, which is why it's sort of trendy right now. Unfortunately, it's more complex to manage. And when you have uh, like a history, you have to kind of keep the, the integrity of the history. So you need to have like versioning of the events. The old events might be slightly different from the new events. Um, it just becomes a lot trickier than just managing the snapshot of the current state. But for many situations, it's worth it. All right. Next, stream processing. So stream, stream processing is like event sourcing um, even more, but even more so. <coughs> so the diagram is getting even more complicated. Um, with stream processing, you basically have these event streams. Um, you're going to have a bunch of event streams coming into you. You're going to pick and choose which events you want to handle. Some of them are interesting, some of them not interesting. So you're going <coughs> to select, you're going to do filter. And then once you've got the events that you're interested in, you turn them into command. You execute the command just like we did. And we, you know, just the same as with the event sourcing thing, we put the data back in the event store. And that generates new events. Right, we run the command that generates new events, which is then handled by the next person down the line. So this is why it's a stream. Each little thing is processing a stream of events coming in, doing some work, generating new events, and that becomes a stream of events going out for the next person. So that's the, that's the concept. Let's look at how it would work um, with a turtle. So one of the things is that you can separate the decision-making process from the state changing process. Um, rather than putting everything in the command handler like you would with basic event sourcing, you can say, well, all I'm going to do is trigger an event, and then you can decide what to do with that event. That event might be important to you, or it might not be important, but I don't get to decide. I'll let you decide. And that gives you a lot more flexibility. So let's say in the turtle situation, we're going to have the command handler, and all it does is update the turtle state. It just figures out where the turtle is on the canvas. But it doesn't actually move the turtle. It doesn't log anything. Um, how, what you do with that information is for the downstream processes to decide. So for example, we might have an audit processor. So every time you do something, it's very important that we keep track of every turtle command, because it's a high security turtle. We want to make sure that nobody's messing with it. Um, a canvas processor might actually move the turtle around the canvas. So we might have a, a physical turtle robot that physically moves the robot. Um, let's say we want to keep track of how many miles the turtle has moved because we want to keep track of whether the battery is about to run out. Um, let's call this a distance 
processor. So three different kinds of business logic, all using um, the same event stream as input. So let's actually look at some real code. Go back to some real code here. Right. <coughs> Where are we? Stream processing. Uh, okay, here's our event process. So the audit processor, this is the handler. So if it moved, we're going to write a message out. If it turned, we're going to write a message out. Uh, if it's you know, changed, we're going to write a message out. And then what we're going to do is start with all the, the event stream as the input. And for each particular event, the observable, we're just going to call that function. So that's our uh, auditing processor. Get that one out of the way. Now here's the canvas processor. And this one, it's only going to draw on the canvas. So it, doesn't, it only needs to care about moved events. So I'm going to have a move filter. So I'm, I'm going to filter out everything other than moved events. So again, I start with all events, but I choose the move events only. And then I just handle those by actually drawing on the canvas, which is that piece of code there. So let's create one of those. And let's do a distance traveled processor. So all this one is just going to keep track of how much you've, how, what the distance is. Just add it to the total distance so far. Um, and then at the end, it's just going to print out the distance traveled. So again, I'm only interested in moved events. So start with all events, uh, choose the moved ones only, and accumulate the distance, and then print that out. So let's do that. All right, so there's our three processes. So here's our event stream. There's our three uh, stream processes. Let's open up the canvas. Let's uh, handle the, whoops, I need to, what's wrong here? I need to cancel this out, try again. Uh, I think I did something wrong here. Let's, let's There we go. So I've moved 100, and then I'm going to turn. Now notice when I moved 100, I got the audit. I also got the distance traveled. When I turned, I didn't get anything happening except the audit. When I move again, uh, the, I got the audit. I got the distance traveled, and I also got the canvas changing. And I do it again, and I do it again. So now the distance traveled is 300. I've got the audit, and I've got the canvas, all three going at the same time. So there you go. It's quite nice. And what's, what's nice is if I have a new kind of business logic, I can just plug another event processor in downstream. I don't have to change the original turtle state processor. So it's got decoupling of the business logic, which is quite a nice feature. <coughs> so the advantages, same as event sourcing. I've got replay history. I've got decoupling. But the, the state and the business logic can be as separate as you like. And you can have multiple consumers of the events. So this is very microservice friendly. Basically, a lot of people use this kind of architecture for doing microservices. Disadvantages, complex. It's getting kind of hard to program. Um, if, we, if you don't need it, I wouldn't do this. This is sort of a fun toy demo. Um, you know, use it if you need to use it. But I wouldn't do it just because it's trendy. <clears throat> OK, so what have we got so far? We've got conscious decoupling um, using data types rather than functions. Um, we're passing, um, uh, we've got these immutable data stores. And we're storing event history rather than the current state. Next, dependency injection. Right, so um, if we had an object oriented class, um, we wouldn't want them to use a particular canvas implementation. We want to pass it in, we want to pass in the logger. So what we do is we create an interface, an iCanvas, and an iLogger. And we inject those interfaces into the turtle class in the constructor. And then the move method would use the canvas and the logger. The turn method would use just the logger. And the pen up would use just the logger and so on. That's OO dependency injection. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Again, if I wanted to decouple the client from the turtle, I would have an iTurtle interface 
and the client would be injected with the eye turtle, and when it wanted to draw a triangle, it would use the eye turtle rather than a particular implementation. So I'm not going to do a demo because I haven't got enough time. So the advantages is people are familiar with this. Um, the disadvantages is quite a few. First of all, you have these unintentional dependencies. So in this model, I passed in a canvas, but only the move function, the move method needed the canvas. The turn function method didn't need it. But it could accidentally access it. So there's a potential uh, bug there, or just even a potential dependency where you, you, you've got this thing depending on something you didn't need to depend on. And often when you use interfaces, they're not fine-grained. Anyone who's used uh, a, you know, a repository interface or a data access layer kind of thing, you, f you find that you know, you've got this customer database thing, and it like get a customer, update a customer, insert a customer, delete a customer, change the customer's password, all these kinds of things. And typically, you know, sometimes you end up with things with like 40 methods on it. You only need one or two of these methods. You only need to like fetch the customer. So do you really want to be able to delete the customer or change the customer's password when all you want to do is fetch the customer from the database? So it's very easy for interfaces to grow, um, which is why you have things like the interface segregation principle. There's various um, I, you know, guidelines to help you avoid doing that. The other thing is when you have these deeply nested dependencies, you often need a, a helper library like a IOC container or something to help you manage all the injection logic. Right. So let's look at functional dependency injection. So in the functional style, there is no class. So every single function needs to have its dependencies passed into it. So the move function needs to have the logging function and the draw function passed in. The turn function needs to have the logging function passed in, and so on and so forth. Now, the nice thing about this is that the turn function can't possibly depend on drawing on the canvas because it's not one of the parameters. So instantly, we have this nice kind of decoupling. Um, you know, you, you're not going to get accidental use between um, the two different functions. But now we have a problem because, and so by the way, these are functions we're passing in. These are not interfaces. We'd, every single thing that the thing needs to do is passed in as a separate parameter. So now we have a, 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 what we had originally was a, a move function that just you passed in the distance. <coughs> but now we have these extra parameters. We have to pass in a logging function. We have to pass in a drawing function. Um, that's kind of awkward. I don't want to have to pass in over and over every single time. <coughs> but we can go back to the currying concept. We can say this is actually a two-parameter function that returns a new function. So what we're going to do is pass in just these first two parameters and not the last one. And that gives us a new function. And the new function has the, the logging function and the drawing function sort of baked in to this new function. And f from the client's point of view, it looks like the original function. It just has this one parameter where you pass in the distance that I want to move. So it's, 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 kind, of like, it's kind of like they've been injected. But the, from, the, from the caller's point of view, you know, I'm back to where I was originally. It's quite nice. So if we look at the implementation for how move worked, we're now passing in the log info and the draw. These are now two function parameters. So this is now a lot of more uh, parameters. Similarly, if I want to turn, I have to pass in the log as a, as a function parameter. Um, but when I use it, I basically create a new function by passing in the first two parameters. Uh, here I'm creating a new function by passing in just the log parameter. So these uh, parameters being passed in, this is the partial application technique, and what's left now is this function which is just what I need, just the, the basic move function. So if I'm using it and actually the client, I'm drawing some stuff, I can just say take the turtle state, you know, move 50, and then turn 120, and I don't have to keep passing in the logger and the canvas over and over and over again. It's kind of baked into the function. So there we go. Uh, and I'm not going to do a demo because I'm short of time. So um, the nice thing about the functional model is, again, everything's explicit. I pass in a parameter. Every single dependency has to be passed in as a parameter. And all the dependencies are passed in as individual functions and not as interfaces. So that you can't get this thing where you have 40 methods being passed in. And so that's a really good counterforce to having too many dependencies. So you don't need to have a, a, a rule saying don't have 40 methods on your interface because you're having 40 parameters. And that's really ugly. You know straight away that something's wrong with your code. You're going to be refactoring it straight away when you have 40 parameters. 
So you basically have a natural countervailing, you know, downhill. The easy, the, the path of least resistance is to have fewer parameters. So you kind of get the ISP for free, the <coughs> interface segregation principle. You don't have to like hard code it, you know, have a special code of view. The other thing is you don't need a special library. You don't need IRC container. It's built in. This thing of using partial application is a fundamental functional programming technique. Um, it's like something you just learn at the very beginning. What's the downside? I don't think there are any. I think this is actually a really nice technique. I use it all the time, and I can't think of anything wrong with it. So there you go. All right, next. We're down to the last two. <coughs> the interpreter. All right, so we have our turtle API. We have our four functions like this. Um, and it looks quite nice, um, but there's some coupling going on again. Um, for example, this is the kind of basic API, but uh, let's say we want to have the results be, um, you know, we don't want to do the error handling thing, so they're going to return results. All right? So that's without the result, and that's with the results. And you say, well, that's nice, but now we've decided to make it async. So now uh, we need to be an async result. Okay? So before and after. Every time we do this, uh, we break the caller. Anyone who's calling this code is now broken. They have to work with asyncs rather than what they had before. Now, normally, that's quite a good thing. It's kind of nice to break the caller. It's nice that you, you, know, you know that when, you, when it compiles, it's going to work. So if it's not compiling, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a nice reminder that you've, something's changed in the API. But it's still kind of annoying. <coughs> is there a way to avoid this? Um, and the answer is yes. The answer is to decouple using data structures again. Um, we saw this before with the batch processing and the actor model and so on. <coughs> if we can turn this into a data structure, we can completely decouple ourselves from actually what's going on behind the scenes, whether it's async or whatever. The only problem is that we can't manage control flow. As we saw with the batch command, there's no control flow. This time, we want to deal with the control flow. So how can we do control flow? Well, if you think about it, um, what we're going to do is we're going to create an interpreter for the data structure. So I am going to send a data structure, which I'm going to call a program. Like It's going to say, I want you to move. The interpreter is going to interpret that some way, whether it moves the turtle or just does something, I don't care. None of my business how it actually works. It's going to return the response, the move response, like the actual distance moved. Now, I can then make a decision based on that response. Like, what am I going to do? I'm going to turn, am I going to move again? Either way, I'm going to create a new program. Okay? So here's the next step and say it's going to be a turn. The interpreter's going to interpret that step. It's going to return the response for that thing. And based on that response, I'm going to make another decision. And I'm going to create another data structure, which contains the information that I want to send to the interpreter, and so on, and back and forth. So you get this back and forth between the client and the interpreter. So how do we write this in code? This one's getting a bit more complicated, so bear with me. Again, we have four cases, one for each um, function in the API, but it's getting ugly. So let's, let me show you how it works. First of all, we have the distance. So for the, for the move case, we have the input parameter to the interpreter. And this is like, this is the distance I want you to move. Okay, the interpreter is going to come back with a response, which in this case is another distance, the distance actually moved. Okay, so that's the output for the interpreter. And then I need to make a decision based on that response, and I'm going to create a new turtle program, which I give back to the interpreter again. Okay? So that's basically the next step for the interpreter. So each of these things generates um, a new program. All right? So this is a series. Uh, if I want to do a turn, it's the same thing. I, I pass in the angle. I don't get any response, and I create another step, and so on. So this is the fundamental model of what we're going to do. Now, the problem with this is that each step returns another turtle program, and so on, ad infinitum. So it goes on for infinity, right? So we're going to have to have another step, which I'm going to call stop. <coughs> That's the end of the interpreter. So this is a new case needed that wasn't in the original design. So let's see how we actually would use it from a client's point of view. So if I want to draw a triangle, I'm going to set this data structure now. This is not a, a command. This is a data structure. And the, the first part of the data structure is what I'm sending you the second part is a function which is given the response, okay, I'm going to give you another program. So it's almost like a callback. It's a continuation. 
you give me this response, I will give you another program. The another program I'm going to give you is a turn. Okay, you're going to give me a response back, I'm going to give you another program, which is a move. You're going to give me a response back, I'm going to give you a turn again, and so on and so forth. And then finally, I'm going to say, okay, I'm done, you can stop now. So that's just how you would draw a triangle using this approach. Ugly again, all these continuations, is there a way to get rid of them? Yes, there is. Yes, we can get rid of them. How can we get rid of them? We use the same thing we did before. We create a special expression, a computation expression that hides it. We've seen this trick many times before. So we're going to call it a turtle program expression. And inside the turtle program, we don't have to worry about these continuations. They get handled for us behind the scenes. So the program, again, looks like an imperative kind of program. Move here, turn here, move here, turn here. <clears throat> but this is data, okay? This is not moving a turtle. This is purely a data structure. It's an abstract syntax tree, if you think. So now I need to interpret this data. So I have this set of instructions. I've created a turtle program. I can have many different interpreters for the same program. So let's talk about a normal interpreter, the, the turtle interpreter. So for each case, I need to handle it. So if it's the stop case, I'm done. If it's the move case, I'm going to move the turtle. I'm going to get the actual distance back. Um, that gets fed into the next step. And now I have in the next program, and I basically call myself again. I loop back recursively and call the interpret function again, but now with the next step in the program. If it's a turn, I turn the turtle. I get the response. I get the next step in the program. And then I call myself again recursively with the next step. This is, I don't expect you to understand this straight away. But you can see it's not that many lines of code. Writing an interpreter is not that hard. Okay. So moving the turtle, executing next step, calling myself recursively. If I want to have a distance interpreter, um, same kind of thing, except all I care about is moving. So if you move, I'm just going to accumulate the distance and um, call myself again. And if it's a turn, I just like no change whatsoever. I just call the next step. All right. So let me see if I can do a quick demo of this. Um, yeah, interpreter's distance, here we go, here's the code for that. So here's the draw triangle program. Um, I'm going to interpret as a turtle. There's the initial state. I'm going to set up my canvas. And now interpret the program. So the program says, turn, move, turn, move, turn, move. All right, so that's one interpretation. Now I can take the same program. OK, exactly the same program. But this time, I'm going to interpret the data structure as a distance thingy. I need the initial distance, which is 0. And I'm going to interpret the program as a distance changing thing. And all it does is print the answer. Here's the total distance moved, it was 300. Okay. So this is really nice. I've really, really decoupled um, the, uh, the, the client from the, from the, you know, from the behind the scenes. <clears throat> OK, the advantages, completely decoupled, nothing but API, no implementation. You can do some neat tricks with optimization. So for example, if I have three moves in a row uh, in, the, in the data structure, I can collapse them into one single move. So that might save time on network you know, thing. Um, the disadvantage is really kind of complex, and it really only works with a, a set of limited operations. Some good examples of this approach, this is called the free monad approach as well. Uh, Twitter's Stitch library, uh, Facebook's Haxel library, they use this technique. All right, so I've just got a few minutes left. Last one. All right, so I'm just going to go a few minutes over. I hope you'll be all right with that. Capabilities. <clears throat> okay, so last one. This is a general thing about calling any API. If I call an API, sometimes it fails. Okay. And then I try calling it again, and sometimes it fails again, and it, it just can't do that. And it's quite annoying if you've got an API and it doesn't really give you any guidance on how to call it. You have to know how the API works in order to call it successfully. And that's quite annoying. So rather than having the API tell you what you can't do, you call it and it says, sorry, I can't do that. You call it, sorry, I can't do that. Rather than saying what you can't do, why not say what I can do? Okay? So this is what I call a capability-based API. 
So a capability is kind of like a key. If you have the key, you can open the door. If you don't have the key, you can't open the door. All right? So I'm going to model cap capabilities kind of like a key. So I make a call to the API, and instead of just giving me a result, the API gives me back a bunch of keys. It gives me back a bunch of capabilities. And each of those capabilities, I can choose which one of those capabilities to use. So which door am I going to open? So OK, I'm going to pick one of those, and I'm going to open the door. And it takes me into a new room, and I get a bunch more capabilities. Because it's like it's one of, the, one of those dungeon games, you know. So in the turtle thing, how does this work in the turtle world? I make a move. So instead of just getting a response back, I get three capabilities back. You can move, you can turn, you can set the pen down, for example. All right, so let me see. I want to move again. Now, this time I've moved to the edge of the board, and I get two capabilities back. I can't move anymore. So rather than trying to move and getting a failure, I literally do not have the capability to move the turtle. That is not one of the functions I can call. So this is the key thing about capability-based programming. <coughs> and this is the code. This is the stru it's a data structure, basically, which is a list of functions. The move function is optional. The turn function, the pen up function, the pen down function, these are all uh, always there. Uh, so when I make a move, I, I pass in a distance, and I get back the capabilities. When I, when I turn, I pass in an angle, and I get back the capabilities, and so on and so forth. So from the caller's point of view, I start with uh, some capabilities. Now, what I have to do is test. Do, is the move function even there? So if the move function is not there, it's an error. Okay? But let me try turning around and see if the move function shows up again. If the move function is there, then OK, I can use it. I'm going to move. Um, but now I've moved, I have to check I get a new set of capabilities. And the move function might not be in the second set. So I have to test the move function again. And if it's nothing, then I can't do the second move, and so on. So the client has to do this logic of checking whether the capability is there or not. So let me do a quick demo, and then I'll be done in literally a minute. So. <coughs> so here's the initial table uh, capabilities. And you can see there's this data structure. And here's the move function. So it's available. So uh, let me move. And I've moved, and now I still have a move function available. So let me move again. And now I've reached the edge of the canvas, and I can't move anymore. And so the move function is now null. It's not available for me to use. But if I turn, I get a new set of capabilities. And this time, there is a move function. So I can use the move function again. And I can keep doing that. So the, 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 with the capability thing, the, the capabilities they have kind of come and go based on whether I can do them or not. So that's kind of nice. So what's the pros and cons of this? Well, the big, the big advantage to me is the client doesn't have to duplicate the business logic. Um, in many situations, you find that the client has to know what to do. It has to understand what the server is actually doing. In this model, the, the client, all it does is follow what the server tells you to do. It says, you can do this, you can't do this. And it's like, OK, I'll just do that. So that gives you some much better security. So for example, you can't accidentally delete the custom because the delete capability is not given to you. Um, you can also do clever things with capabilities. You can transform them. Because they're just functions, you can, if you want to say a business rule, you can only use the turtle between 9 and 5 on weekends or something. Um, you can just take one of those capabilities and wrap it up in another function, uh, and that function you know, adds that extra constraint that you can only use at a certain time. So capabilities are great if you're doing complex business rules. Downsides, really complex. And the client has to handle this unavailable functionality, which really it should be doing anyway. All right, classic example of this is hypertext is the engine of application state. Proper RESTful architecture is exactly this model. You get back a bunch of links, and you follow the links. And if the link's not there, you can't do it. And if the link is there, you can do it. Um, that's a really nice model. All right. More on this. I have a talk on this at uh, cap slash cap on my website. And that is it. So thank you very much. Um, say the slides will be at the slash turtle directory. If you need F Sharp Consulting, contact us at F Sharp Works. If you want to know more about F Sharp, including instructions on how to download and install it, go to fsharp.org. So thank you very much. And I'll be available for questions if you want.